one next for me? Yeah. And we have, uh, okay. And we have speed. Thank you. Can we? It's okay to turn south now. Can you please tell me what you're doing right in New York right now? The last few days. Uh, the, the last week and a half have been so full of things because uh, um, there's a, a, a wonderful composer here called Philip Glass, who's recognized, I think, and deservedly so, as one of America's best composers. Um, Philip and I have known each other for years, since the 70s. And three years ago, he did um, a symphony based on uh, an album that Eno and I, Brian Eno and I did, called he uh, Low. And that, I believe, was fairly successful for him. So this last month or two, he's been doing Heroes as a, a secondary symphony. So I've been going along to those rehearsals. And I was absolutely knocked out to find that he'd also given it to Twyla Tharp, the choreographer. Mm -hmm. to uh, make into a ballet and so suddenly those pieces of music have a new life with uh, Philip and he's asked me if I'll write the third one with him so we're sort of making notes toward a third symphony which would be my first symphony but but at his third so there's been that uh, then uh, I've been recording uh, a new album with uh, my my touring band um, that we've started putting down tracks we've put down three new pieces and rehearsing for the upcoming tour because I've mm -hmm. changed a lot of the songs and I'm putting new songs in uh, as well. And and uh, today I had a, a show, a, a, a visual art show, a painting show, an installation show open up in Basel in Switzerland. So I was I was sending out wet canvases <laughs> this last week, <laughs> really <laughs> finishing finishing touches for that. And I got a, a an installation at the ICA in London mm -hmm. on a, opens on Thursday, so I've been making up uh, <sighs> videotapes for that. And, uh, and that's and I think I'm still married. <laughs> <laughs> you miss your wife? Well, she's here, but oh. I, I don't I don't see her much. I see her in the mornings and mm -hmm. very late at night. It's been really tough these last couple of weeks. And how does doing all the concerts? is involved with that. What's new for you in this Well, I, I think for me, as always, over this last uh, part of my life, the last 10 years, I've really only wanted to do concerts that firstly pleased me. Um, if they also please the audience, then that's wonderful. But, but my priority is to remain interested in, in what I'm doing. So I made a kind of a fairly radical decision in 1990 to not do any more so-called hits or the singles type material. And uh, I sort of put those songs virtually to bed at that time. Things like Let's Dance and Gene Genie and, and all those things. Um, so the touring uh, repertoire has become a combination of songs from the last album that I've done, the one with Brian Eno called mm -hmm. Outside. And uh, I would say 40% are older songs, but they're not necessarily one would associate them as classics or hits. And they're quite, some of them are quite unusual. Um, so like which ones? Well, uh, 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 now we've just uh, we just put in uh, um, Aladdin Sane from the album Aladdin mm -hmm. Sane. Major reason is that the pianist Mike Garson, who was playing on that in 1974. Is, uh, is, is working with me again after all these mm -hmm. years. I haven't worked with him since Also, is he, he's in your live band also? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it, uh, we are on the last leg of the tour, he said, you remember? You know, I said, yeah, so it's a great song. He said, why don't we do that? So we, we worked it out this last couple of weeks, and it, it sounds wonderful. That sort of thing. Things like All the Young Dudes, which is a song that, although I wrote, was not really my song. It was Mot the Hoople. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm doing my version on this thing. Another song that I wrote, which is not associated with me, Lust for Life, yeah. uh, of Riggy Pop, yeah. so I'm doing my version of that. Um, what else? What else? Baby Universal, which is a song from Tin Machine. Um, mm -hmm. So I go, I, I, I'm really sort of, it's covering some really interesting areas. Within a month or so, the people of Israel will see you live on stage. Yeah. Take us backstage 30 minutes before the concert. What's going on there? Um, 
Uh, generally, we're eating. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that we're casual about our shows, but I don't. I, I think um, we probably have a, a certain kind of arrogance. I mean, we're, we we know how good a band we are, um, and we don't really get a nervous thing very much. I think because it's such a pleasure to work, we enjoy doing the shows like this because we have a real, real interest in the music. And for every night is pertinent. Every night is is an interesting night. There's a lot of room for improvisation within the band, and I think that that is uh, something that we also look because you never quite know how it's going to feel or sound that night. Um, so we're fairly relaxed. Probably finishing food. Gail is probably doing a hair. She's our bass player. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Mike Garson's phoning his wife. Mm -hmm. Reeves Cabrels is phoning his wife. <laughs> Zachary Orford, our drummer, who's uh, probably phoning his wife, <laughs> and I'm phoning my wife. So that's and family four, time. The four guys are phoning their wives, mm -hmm. and Gail isn't married, so she may be sort of like. I must ask you, how come it's only it's only your first concert in Israel? I do you know. I don't know. I've all my tours over the last ten years have been with uh, Bill Zisblatt, who uh, has been our promoter and our producer. And it, every time we've gone on tour, uh, Zisblatt has said, this time we're going to go to Israel, and every time we've never gone. But then we've never gone to Athens either, and the Iceland... And I, get, and I understand that you'll be there. I'm sorry? I, and I understand that you'll be playing now in Greece. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there are several places that we've never worked before. This is, I think there's some really ex exciting places for us uh, that we've, none of us have ever played. I've been to Russia, for instance, several times as a tourist. But I never played there. But this time we play St. Petersburg and Moscow, and then, as I said, Iceland and, mm -hmm. and Greece and uh, Israel. They're all new. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Because it's your first interview with an Israel public, Israeli publication, I wonder if you, if you like, we can talk a little bit about the earlier days of your career. Uh, if it's fine with you. Well. Yeah, you know, the trouble is with the earlier, like all that past from glam rock onwards, it's like I've talked about it so much. And so let's talk glam rock backwards, <laughs> even earlier times. Even earlier? I mean, yeah, because I mean, usually an artist follows one route with small diverse turns, and yeah. then you can say where, where is it coming from and what is his roots, and I wonder which one are yours, which one are your I earliest musical memories absolutely are. absolutely no idea what my, my real roots are. They're so, they're so diversified. Uh, I liked, uh, ever since I was sort of eight, eight, twelve, something like that, my, I really, uh, I really latched onto music in a major way. Uh, also, uh, along with painting and drawing, I mean, the, the two things, the music and the visual, always, always were kind of uh, the same thing to me, just a, um, a different way of expression. Um, and as a kid, I guess, I, it, it ranged between Little Richard, um, uh, but I even like things like Stan Kenton, you know, the Stan Kenton. No, I don't know him. I mean, no, I know the name. Before your time. <laughs> Stan Kenton, big band, uh, and, and John Coltrane. I liked very much, and because uh, that was the first instrument that I wanted to play was the saxophone. Uh, because I, f for two reasons, one I loved the uh, the horn section with uh, Little Richard. I thought the saxophone lineup was so impressive. <laughs> it was such a magical sound. Uh, and then I got into jazz, you know, really early age when I was about twelve or thirteen. I was really hooked on things like Eric Dolphy and uh, and John Coltrane and all that. Um, but at the same time, I always loved, uh, um, I always loved classical music as well. Stravinsky, particularly, I adored. Um, and music in all its forms, I think there wasn't one aspect of it that didn't offer something that I found just t so exciting and uh, um, enlightening in, in a way. And the same with the visual art, the, sa the same thing. I have such eclectic taste, it's so wide. It ranges t even today between modernists like uh, Damien Hirst, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, his school, um, uh, to, for me, sat three of the greatest British painters, uh, David Bomberg, uh, Leon Kossoff, and uh, uh, Frank Auerbach, who 
all came up in Britain around the 50s and were doing almost their own variation on abstract expressionism. Those three became for me the central core of what, what great British art is. So, I mean, it really, it's so, it's so wide. It, it Please correct me if I'm wrong, but your colleagues from your generation in the British music scene yeah. that really were heavily R&B influenced. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you're a little yeah. bit different than them. Yeah, I, I, again, like all, uh, as you say, most of my contemporaries, were, we were all, I mean, we, we had, it was a fantastically vital period in, in 60s London in as much that uh, American uh, R&B and soul music was really, it was so hard for those artists to work in America. And what was happening, that there was such excitement about them in Britain that all the legends were from, from John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters, they were all coming to London. And so in this virtual village of blues clubs that we had in London, we were seeing the greatest blues stars that ever had happened, you know. Um, so it was an enormous influence. It, it really gave a new vitality to uh, British rock. But my, maybe my focus uh, sort of also kept going out to the periphery. I mean, I wasn't just content with that. I, I liked too much, you know. I liked musical theatre. I liked, uh, you know, kind of musical theatre. I liked that sort of thing as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about a, a little bit about the mid and late 60s, the period of time where uh, you've been working and releasing stuff, and at least commercially, it didn't, sort of didn't make it big. So well, what kept you yeah. going? How did you... Well, the late 60s for me, I think, was a, a, an extreme, uh, probably a really extremely formative period, because I was doing, again, I was very diversified. I was, I was working um, as a songwriter, singer, sax player in my own band, I also was working um, uh, some of the time to make money. I was working in a, uh, as a commercial artist in an advertising agency. Mm -hmm. And also I was with a, um, a kind of a very avant-garde mime troupe well, Lindsay in Kemp. London, the Lindsay yeah. Kemp Company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I, I guess it was the era of the multimedia event uh, which always made sense to me. The idea of pulling in the visual and the music, uh, theatre and an atmosphere, and creating uh, almost an alternative universe, I, get, I suppose probably started around that time um, for me. And I, I, guess that's, I guess that's where I come from. And Tony Newley. <laughs> Tony Newley was a huge influence on me. Not when he went to America, because it was all over. All over Tony when he went to uh, America. But the period when he was uh, actually sort of finding his own way in Britain, he did an extraordinary television series called The Strange World of Gurney Slade, which no longer exists. I, I actually asked the BBC if they still had it, but they threw it all away, really? like they do. You know, they throw away such incredible things. Um, but it was almost uh, an ac accessible existential comedy series. It was very strange. He was a very isolated, solitary man in the series, and all the time it was um, just his over-voice talking about how he saw the world and, and, uh, and his perceptions of it, which were all very surreal, almost like a, as, though it, as though it was somebody like Magritte talking or, or whatever. It was a very weird series, and it was very late night on British television, but I thought that was really cool. It was really good, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your work as a songwriter. How does it work? Do does sound and vision really come together? or Yeah, they always have done for me. I've never... Mm -hmm. I, as I'm creating a song, and I create songs these days, and I, I, I developed so many techniques over the years about how to put a song together or how to create a texture. Because uh, some of them, sometimes they're... they're they're so loosely songs. I mean, they're just pieces. Uh, for instance, on the new album, there's a piece called "Small Plot of Land," mm -hmm. which is is um, really tenuously a song. I mean, you could. It doesn't have a chorus or a, a verse uh, structure at all. I mean, it's this sort of this diaphanous piece of work that lasts six minutes, and it has a beginning and an end, and then areas in the middle. Um, uh, and so, really, for me, they're textures and atmospheres. Um, and I really got sort of involved in that way of writing with Brian Eno when we first worked in the late 70s. Um, 
but I also quite like the construction of more formal songs. I mean, with this new album that I'm working on with my, my touring band, uh, quite several of these pieces are actually pre-written, which is something that I haven't done for a long time. So it's, it's quite, it's it's not quite not a discipline, quite yeah. a fun actually writing songs before I get into the studio. <laughs> so it's not like you have loads of demos from previous years and every yeah. time you're supposed to make it up. No, no, the no, trigger no. has to come from... Yeah, mm, I'm, terribly s I'm really susceptible to uh, uh, my environment. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm, very, I, 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 I'm very open to that. Uh, wherever I am and whoever I'm with has a very strong influence on, on how I'm going to react to, to actually making my art. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about a few of your, let's say, teachers. People like yeah, Lindsay, Lindsay Kemp, Kemp or Anthony Newell. Lindsay Newell. Kemp was incredibly responsible for virtually what to do on the stage. He really gave me, if, if there's such a thing as uh, in rock as stage craft, it came from Lindsay, not from other rock acts. You know, mm -hmm. it really, Lindsay really sort of gave me a, an insight into how you communicate from the stage. Um, and also the feather boa. <laughs> Really? That came from Lindsay, <laughs> yeah. And I wonder, who would you say? Lindsay Kemp probably was responsible because of me <laughs> for the feather boa in rock. Mm. <laughs> and who would you say are your? I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing. <laughs> yeah. I, and who would you say are your your, your best pupils or the, the ones whom you enjoy the most? Oh, there I are enjoy ma I mean so many. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hundreds of them. Do you mind if I smoke? No. Um, I. I I'm still really a fan of rock music. I mean, I have to be because uh, I can't, I can't, I don't do very convincing work if I'm not interested in my subject. And I love music and I love listening to what younger bands are doing, younger artists are doing. And it still never ceases to really capture me when I hear something that is really pushing the envelope or something very new that's sort of, you know, an interesting <laughs> new place. That's, I think, uh, it's the same with visual art, you know, I love to see the new, I mean, I'm really proud of the new young Brit artists because we're yeah. doing such great things at the moment. Um, well, screw it all up, of course, because um, the, the British government won't back anything and they'll, they'll all end up now. I mean, Amer Damien's just had a huge show here in, in New York mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, it was so popular that I, s I expect Damien to be here in two years, you know, we're losing in England. We're good at inventing things, but we don't know how to market them. We've got no idea. We let them all go. Um, why did I get there? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, so the younger bands. I mean, people like Tricky, for instance. Uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think Tricky's doing extraordinary things. I think he's just really fantastic. The, of the American bands, I think Smashing Pumpkins is really excellent. Um, and there again, I think Nine Inch Nails, in a very dark... It's an area that I find maybe negative. Well, it's their dialogue that they wish to set up, so that's their, res you know, it's their responsibility and it's what they do. It's not particularly an area that I, w I would want to go in myself, but I recognize within it a really strong uh, uh, vocabulary. I mean, it's a really, s the sonic vocabulary is incredible with, with nails. I think Trent is really a great talent. Um, who else do I like? Uh, well, I like people maybe who aren't so well known. Uh, there's a singer called Scott Walker yeah. in Britain who I think makes some of the most compelling music mm -hmm. in, in Europe, you know? I think also, I think he's got the greatest voice in rock and roll. Without doubt, there is nobody to touch him. He's the most extraordinary singer. Absolutely incredible. Uh, fortunate enough to uh, actually know, know him. And I think, I think he's... Uh, I, I admire his integrity. I think uh, I can't. Every album that he's made, there's not any sense of compromise. Uh, I think he's terribly brave. I'm not that brave. <laughs> I think I probably always wanted to have an inroad into accessibility to an extent uh, that Scott doesn't. He just doesn't recognise. You know. But the trouble is, of course, with Scott, is that, that, that the unfortunate thing is that nobody's ever heard him, you know? He won't get played on the radio, nobody ever buys him, he sells no albums, and he's eking out a living, 
virtually, you know. He lives in London. Incredibly talented man. But he makes an album every seven years. Yeah, which is even more. I mean, yeah. There's a period of ten years or so they didn't release anything. It's kind of like years. Ferry, you know. Brian Ferry is like, he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't deliberate for quite so long. But you have to wait like three years, or four years before Ferry brings out an album. Mm -hmm. Quite extraordinary. Let's talk a little bit about your relationship or your working relationship with Iggy Pop because I think yeah. that it's quite unparalleled in the history of rock music. So well, yeah, I, uh, is it really? Is that I, I, I c please tell me if you know of any other two great artists who collaborate so much uh, and on a working environment. I guess you know I don't actually. Do you know nobody's ever said that before? That's really an extraordinary thing. I don't think I've ever thought about that. Um, Please correct me. I mean no, I can't try to think, no. actually. You've got me on the spot a bit. I don't know. Uh, yes, it was very odd. It was very odd that it, that it went on. Uh, because, we, I mean, we still, I still see Jim. Um, in fact, we're working on this tour. Uh, several shows we're working together. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he hasn't heard my version of Last for Life yet. No. <laughs> uh, but I guess uh, working musically, we stopped working probably in the, must have been in the middle eighties. I think the last piece of work we did together was blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it came out of a sense of being casualties. Uh, <laughs> we both under, uh, underwent massive, huge drug problems, uh, really intense ones, both of us at approximately the same time. Um, and I think we both wanted to completely turn our lives around because they'd gotten so terrible. And out of that sense of desperation, I think we started working together to kind of, I guess, all those things. There's, a, I don't know what the, uh, where the balance lies between work becoming an expression and it being actual therapy of some kind, you know. Sometimes you work artistically and you're actually, uh, yeah, you're actually examining yourself and seeing where who you are and where your lightest and darkest areas are and why you've got those and is is there an imbalance in there somewhere? And I mean, for instance, now I, the work that I do, a lot of it is uh, quite dark, but I've probably never been happier or more buoyant, buoyant and and sort of probably I'm at the stablest that I've ever been as a person ever in my life, but there's still all this stuff in there that's like, you know, where does this shit come from? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like Stephen King lives in the back of my head or something. It's like, huh? Well, you can go and read the lyrics for something like The Men Who Sold the World or all this stuff for... It's but, you know, I guess there's one line of continuity throughout, the, uh, thr throughout my work um, uh, ever since I began, and it's there's some kind of spiritual search. I mean, I... I I resign myself to the fact that what I really was in need of all my life is some spiritual base, um, which I know is kind of not terribly popular thing these days to kind of want to uh, re have as a centre to revolve around. But I, I find, uh, I don't know, there's something about the established church, for instance, that has absolutely no appeal to me. I'm terribly suspicious of established religion. Um, I guess the only time I felt comfortable with uh, a philosophy, I can't even call it a religion, would be uh, with Buddhism. It's the only time that I studied anything that kind of made a, an irrational sort of sense to me. I mean, the idea of transience and change, mm -hmm. I think also became very central to my life. And it was something that I studied when I was uh, probably 17 or 18. I was the, uh, like a 10 minute Buddhist. Uh, as probably all of us were back then in the 60s. And I studied Mahayana Buddhism with, uh, with a Tibetan, a Tibetan guru. <laughs> in London. I even had my own guru, yeah. His name is Chimmy Young Dung Rinpoche. And actually to this day he still, he works at the British Museum in London doing translations of uh, scrolls that he got out of Lhasa. He was, uh, he was a, a professor of music in the Patala in Lhasa. And, uh, and he's doing translations to this day. I, c I come across him every now and again. 
and it's always like a reminder of um, I should concentrate more on my meditation. <laughs> Let, let's go back a little bit for the dark side, because it's Oh, no, no, hold on. Uh, okay. uh, uh, we're working with Iggy, I know, because yeah. that's where we were. So Iggy and I, I mean, we were both uh, really flapping, uh, flapping around in, in, in the depths of, uh, of uh, anxiety and, and drug intoxication and addiction, I think. Um, and I just don't know how, why the chemistry was so good. Probably because we're so opposite to each other. Jim works. Uh, everything about Jim is on the on the surface, on the skin. It's very, uh, it's very vibrant and very expressive in a very simple way. Um, and I'm not. I get convoluted. I get lost in my own vagueness. I'm I, I'm at my most comfortable when I'm in a vague area. Vague is my forte. <laughs> I once read a great uh, a great quote of yours that you said that he's oh, no, uh, red and you're awful. blue. Or that, that no, I thought. It, that that you're blue and he's red, and that's what. If it's that's not right bad. Yeah, all right. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll stand by that one. <laughs> and you know, and you know. By the way, I thought that you're s in your sax playing, you're red also, and it's interesting. Probably, yeah. If I if I had, if there's well, I know there's passion in me. I know there's terrific passion in me, but I'm awfully nervous about expressing it. I think it probably comes out in in things like that. Um, I can only express it very privately. You know, so hopefully. My wife is the recipient of my passion. Uh, I'm not a passionate performer. A lot of it is by rote, and it's a lot. A lot of it is very stylized, you know. Is it the sort? Well, of Jim is, of course, is uh, is totally instinctive of the second kind of thing. Although I can be like that when I'm writing. In in, in an, I, I guess in an, I, I'm I'm quite I'm quite good spontaneously in an intellectual situation. Mm -hmm. But my physicality is, uh, uh, remains often stylized and, and uh, 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 works within the realms of vocabulary that I know and I'm sure that, that you see has been, that's because I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> Capricorns yeah. are like that. We don't do anything publicly until we've rehearsed it. Yeah, I've noticed that, for instance, in your relationship with the media. No, me, but what's happening? Okay. <laughs> da, 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 da. Why don't we uh, switch tape right here so we can make sure All right. We're still actually doing some kind of work with each other as well. Trent and I are talking uh, at the moment about maybe doing some stuff later next year, uh, some record interesting <laughs> recording projects. Because I think we, we have a fascination with it. There's some areas where we overlap, you know, in terms of what we look for in a texture. And it's those areas probably that we might be able to... I love collaboration. I really like working with other people. A lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Can we? Yeah. Thank you. So I want to go back again to this thing of you. You're <coughs> saying that you're being self-reserved. Yeah. Uh, publicly. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about the gender stuff of yeah. the 70s, <laughs> because most people talk about it, discuss it, analyze it, but you've been sculpting yourself and testing the boundaries between between the sexes. So yeah, I think an awful lot of it had to do with that. Um, I think the environment that I grew up in as a teenager was ripe for sexual experimentation and uh, for g losing your identity. Uh, see, I don't, I'm not sure how much of it came from actually looking and searching and finding your identity. A lot of it, I think, ca uh, was about losing your identity. And for somebody, I think, like myself, who always had an awful problem um, actually with the idea of self-realization i think it was it was an invitation to get lost in other characters and other people and other ways of life um, also a, a lot of the work that i was doing was on a fairly radical gay front i mean the lindsay kemp company was like radically gay 
Uh, all the stuff that we did with Jean Geno, and it was like the, the maids and Our Lady of the Flowers, and we were always getting banned everywhere, and it's been overtly, you know, <laughs> Gay Pride Week, <laughs> and all that. And and the music that I was listening to at that time, uh, in pop music or rock music, was a lot of it was soul music, and that wasn't very popular in, believe it or not, in the mainstream and the best soul and James Brown and all that stuff was played in the gay clubs, it wasn't played in straight clubs. Um, so I guess that's where my background was in. You know, so on the one hand you spoke about testing or looking, yeah. going to other identities, but on the yeah. other hand you must have huge amounts of self-confidence to do it. Because most people I never want... Thought, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if it, anything that I did came out of confidence or whether it came from a need of, well, anything's better than this <laughs> you know I had uh, took me ages to build up a, it really took me a long time to build up um, a, 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 a really good now this is sounding like armchair psych, uh, psychoanalysis took me a long time to build up a good self-esteem you know it really did for many many years all through the years when I was exceedingly popular all the characters I created um, I really was a bundle of, of self-doubt I really had so much self-doubt and lack of awareness of who I was or what I wanted, uh, uh, I would just f flow with the tide from one thing to another. I, I, it, I, it would just grab for anything that would give me some sense of identity. It took an awful long time for me to sort myself out. It really did. I think, I think I'm looking at a light at the end of the tunnel. I just hope it's not another train. <laughs> yeah. When did it came? Oh, oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> delighted in the end. Uh -huh. I think I, I think I'm going. I think I'm going to. I think yeah. I'm going to Russia now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the darkness at the end of the tape. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> you know something so funny. I for this for this. Uh, uh, I'm doing an installation, as I said earlier, at the mm -hmm. ICA in London, and part of it is using old video that I had from 1974. I had one of the first reel-to-reel -reel black and white video machines made by Sony, which went out of production in 1976, I think. So I found in Switzerland, where I live, stacks of these old tapes, and I've been going through them this week, and it's stuff I haven't seen for 22 years, and it's, it's really hard dealing with how I was and what I was like back then. I mean, it's like being... Oh, really therapeutic and I'm not sure it's such a great thing <laughs> although some of the art movie stuff I mean I was obviously really preoccupied with the idea of video as the next form so there's a lot of experimental stuff that's kind of interesting but then catching myself on camera and seeing how I looked and what I was like and it's 74 so it's just the real beginning of my heavy addiction you know and I think who is that guy it's like really strange Anyway, that's, a, Next that's, that's an aside. Can I have one more question? If it's okay with you, or should it's we? It's going to be difficult. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> yeah. That is very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. We're all, I think, really very, very excited about playing. It's going to be a fabulous... We're on with Massive Attack, I think. Yeah. Who I love as well. Yeah. Really, really enjoy them. It's okay. Thank you very much. I hope that I see you there. Yeah, sure. Best wishes. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, we will very much indeed. Mike Garson's been there, so.